Hello there, friends. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who has supported the podcast over the last couple of weeks. Earlier this week, the episode with James Clear landed the show in the top 50 podcasts worldwide, which was a lovely thing to wake up to on Tuesday morning. So thank you very much for sharing it. The feedback I've had over the last few episodes has been so fantastic. And um, yeah, I I have to pinch myself every day to realize that I actually get to share oxygen or bandwidth sometimes with literally some of the cleverest people on the planet. With that in mind, I thought I would give you a quick rundown of some of the upcoming guests. So on Monday, Professor David Sinclair from Harvard Medical School, one of Time Magazine's 50 most influential health professionals on the planet, talking about whether or not a human can live to be a thousand years old. Rachel Kleinfeld, who advises the UK and US government on how to govern correctly. Tim Briggs from We Dominate Nutrition. Don McGregor, COO of Social Chain, is back again. Theo and Eve from the Social Minds podcast. George McGill, innovation lead at Media Chain. But today we're talking all things money management with Chris Hutchins, who is the CEO and founder of Grove. He uh, started a company called Milk, which got acquired by Google in 2012. And then he spent most of his time at Google as a partner, uh, helping startups and investing in early stage companies. So this guy knows what he's talking about. I really enjoyed the conversation. I can't wait to have him back on as well. Please welcome Chris Hutchins. Mr. Chris Hutchins, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Very, very good happy to be here. Very, very happy to have you on. We're talking all things money today, right? Yes. Yeah, it's been like the obsession of my life. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think it's the obsession of a lot of people's lives, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's something that causes more stress than anything else uh, for most people. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. So for the listeners who don't know who you are, could you give us a bit of a background? Sure. Uh, Where do I begin? Uh, (laughs) You know, the whole my whole life I've been obsessed with money, but more professionally, I spent the last you know, 10 years in startup land. Um, I got my first job out of college, uh, thinking I should go into investment banking and management consulting and ultimately got laid off, which gave me this opportunity to take what, you know, isn't very common in America, but effectively was like a gap year later in life where I, I took seven months with, uh, my now wife and we traveled, came back in about 2011 and was like, this is the industry I'm going to work in and have been working in Silicon Valley for, tech companies, starting tech companies, uh, sold a company to Google, spent some time at Google investing in startups and, you know, have, have basically lived my entire last decade in, in immersed in Silicon Valley. <laughs> that must be pretty crazy. It seems like such a fast paced, very quickly moving environment. It is definitely that it is a wild place to be, you know, companies are growing. You know, I look back to, you know, I tried to pick the hottest company to work at when I first got back from my trip. And it was a company called Simple Geo that ended up not working out. And my wife uh, took a job at a company that neither one of us were all that convinced at the time, you know, would be the biggest company, you know, possible. And, you know, now it's it it grew into Lyft and uh, (laughs) she's been at Lyft for nine years. And so it's one of those kind of crazy adventures where you never know what what's going to happen. You know, it might be six people in a small room that, you know, now is a 5,000 person company. Yeah, totally. I was reading an article recently about the electric scooter um, <laughs> bird and, uh, the, uh, what is it? Lime? Is it lime scooters? Bird has them. Lime, spin, scoot, lift has, um, Uber's getting into uh, it as well, right? They're trying to buy someone and they've already, I think, did yeah, they, they bought f- a company called jump that has bikes, and I don't know what their scooter plan is, but it's, yeah, it's crazy. You know, you, I was in LA this weekend and there were so many it's scooters everywhere. everywhere. It was crazy. Yeah. I went to LA last summer and I, I couldn't, I was like, what, is this a trend that no one's told me about? Like, why is everyone whizzing around on electric scooters? But I, I was reading, I think it was towards the back end of last year that the valuation on those companies went like, 500 million, 1 billion, 10 billion, like month on month on month. I think that was what happened with Bird or something like that. 
it's been really, really crazy. So, uh, I, bird and lime and yeah, it's, it's kind of wild. Um, I don't even know how to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but this must be maybe not to that kind of degree, but these crazy takeoffs must kind of be 10 a penny in, in Silicon Valley. There's always someone on the up and someone on the down and yeah, I mean, I spent about three years at Google Ventures investing in companies and, you know, we probably invested in 300 companies in the, the time I was there. And, you know, every week, month, it's, it's you know, a different trend. You know, one month it's, you know, we've got to invest in all, there was four companies at one point in time that help you sell a used car. And it was like the hottest market. Everyone, you know, everyone was investing in companies that help you sell a used car. And, you know, now I don't think any of those companies are around or maybe one of them is. But, you know, it was such a frenzy for a very short period of time. It was pretty crazy. Where are those signals coming from? You know, this like weird hype cycle of fear of missing out and things happening at the same time and people getting scared and, you know, people seeing big markets and opportunities and not knowing how it'll evolve and all that. It comes from everywhere. But, yeah, it's pretty Pretty crazy. Yeah, it must be. It must have been a, a bit of a baptism of fire working in that particular department at Google. Yeah, it was awesome. Like you know, you just get to intimately see all of the crazy stuff that's <laughs> happening, and uh, you know, I can't imagine anything better than you know getting that exposure. Especially, I didn't know I wanted to start a company after that, but you know, that was you know great exposure to all the ups and downs of entrepreneurial life before you leave to go, you know, take on that job again. Yeah, for sure. It's like a 1.6 bar pressure washer hose straight to the face of like high volume startups, right? Yeah. I mean, where else do you get to learn about, you know, I I must have seen a thousand pitches and, you know, (laughs) we did a few hundred investments. It's just crazy. You know, you get to see it all. So if you were to pick out some of the elements of good pitches, is there any, any things that stood out that you thought I need to, when I'm considering uh, doing my own stuff, are there any principles from that that you thought were super good? Yeah. I mean, I think something sometimes people overlook is that, you know, VCs aren't necessarily like the details of the numbers at the early stage are secondary to the person in the room. And so, you know, the whole thing starts with like, is this a person that can achieve this wild, ambitious thing? And when that wild, ambitious thing is so far away and so big, you know, it's less about you showing that here's how step by step the numbers work over the next 10 years, because like none of that is like ever going to actually be true. It's more, (laughs) is this the person that cares about this enough to deal with all the crap that comes with starting a company? Do they care about this industry enough, the problem they're solving enough? Can they hire the right people? Can they build the right team? And it's it really comes down to, to the founders. And if you can buy into the founders and they're not building something in a tiny marketplace um, and you have either the reason to believe that they could build the product or they've already demonstrated they can build it, like, mm. you know, a lot of the other stuff is much less important at the early stage. Yeah, so enough caffeine before you go in, like the the right <laughs> level of caffeine concentration in your blood. Yeah, you've got to be excited. Like if that doesn't shine through, you have bigger problems. Like <laughs> you have to be passionate. I always tell people like the number one skill of a founder is storytelling. It's not, um, you know, there's all these other things that matter. But if you can't walk into a room and tell a story that gets people excited, you know, you won't have the opportunity to talk about your management skills or your product skills or your marketing skills. Yeah, you got to get yourself through the door first. Steve Bartlett, the CEO of Social Chain over here in the UK, which is a big social media agency, pretty much one of the main reasons why that company has been successful is because of Steve's personality. That they, the guys at Social Chain, and one of my buddies, Peter, was like one of the first 10 employees. And this this company's massive now. They've got offices in New York and they're expanding all over the world and they did Manchester United's like a uh, marketing campaign and et cetera, et cetera. And um, one of the main areas of their marketing strategy is get Steve in front of a big crowd of people and then someone spend a lot of time on his LinkedIn as soon as it finishes, because like, that's what happens. You put him in a room and he just, people just gravitate towards him. Um, and he seems to have, that allure and and that energy that sells people, especially 
when you think about a company like that. And, you know, a lot of the listeners may be working in digital marketing, social media marketing, or, you know, an, a, an easy side hustle at the moment, because I still don't think it's a saturated market for small businesses, is to start doing social media consulting. Like if you're like a, a Gen Yer, and you've grown up on social media, you understand how it works. But there are, within a 20-mile radius of you, where you live right now, there's probably a 100 coffee shops and cafes and sandwich bars and all the rest of it who don't even have, like, a, a Google or Yell listing. Like, they, they won't exist online. And, you know, a common side hustle for those people is to is to be able to get into this and for Steve to set himself apart and to really convince the old guard of marketing that social is a way to go and they should strongly consider portioning off a lot of their income a lot of their marketing budget towards that is just him selling how excited he gets about social media he's like he's like yep. like a like a young gary vaynerchuk from the uk but less less swearing. that's amazing he's a bit, he's yeah a less I mean, sweary gary is like just a, such an intense personality i owe a lot to him for you know for pushing me i've known him for um, easily over 10 years but uh yeah like some people just have that ability to captivate an audience at any point in time and, and can do a lot of good with it. That's fantastic. So we wanted to talk a little bit. We, we had a lot of requests for advice for people's personal finances. And I think that as exciting as it is, I do want to hear some more stories from Google. I think we'll come back to that in a bit. But um, a lot of people, I, I certainly didn't learn basics of anything to do with how to manage my own finances. I didn't understand before I went to uni, I didn't understand what an asset or a liability was. I didn't understand how a mortgage worked or anything like that. So do you have some principles that you stick to for your personal finances? Yeah. And first off, like you're not alone, right? You know, it's whether it's the UK or the US or probably anywhere else, like we're not, it doesn't seem like anyone's getting taught these principles in school. Um, and, you know, there was a world that, you know, my parents kind of grew up around, but maybe didn't grow up in where, you know, you work for a company for 30 years and that company takes care of you for the rest of your life. And, you know, they pay for everything later. And um, that's great. But it doesn't happen for us now. And with so many people being, you know, freelancers and self-employed and, you know, the average time I think people I know change jobs is like, you know, three or four years, not 30 or 40 years. So, yeah. you know, we don't build up a, a pool of retirement assets or pensions tied to a company that's enough to sustain us. So we kind of really have to figure it out on our own. Um, education just hasn't caught up. So it's kind of frustrating for a lot of people. I couldn't agree more. The, the only reason that I'm in any way slightly capable with my finances is because I've got two business partners who are fantastic and there's been like a a trickle down effect I've been kind of begging in the gutter like just desperately trying to glean any last little second nuance of of understanding about how to organize my money and then you know the fact that I've managed to not bankrupt myself is probably a testament to their abilities Yep, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so with regards to where people should start or how they should consider or look at their own personal finances, where do we begin? Man, so, you know, I, I have a typical, like, how do you think about this, where do you begin concept, which is like, you know, step one is just like start to take ownership of what you're thinking about. Um, you know, learn the concept of assets and liabilities and, you know, summarize where you're at. You know, first first thing I think everyone should start to do is just understand where they're starting from. You know, make a list of all the accounts they have, make a list of, you know, the ones that have positive balances, whether that's brokerage or, you know, you know, a savings account or an invest retirement account. And then also look at, you know, anything that's that's, you know, falls into the debt camp, you know, whether it's a credit card or a mortgage or a loan. Um, you know, when you add up all the positives and subtract, you know, everything else, you end up with your net worth, which I think is something that a lot of people have never taken the time to look at, but it's kind of like a core thing to start with when you're trying to figure, figure out where you're going. Yeah. What, what am I, what's my current worth at? Yeah. And then, so I, you know, in accounting terms, we'd say like, make your balance sheet an income statement, which scares people. So <laughs> we'll avoid those for the rest of this conversation. But <laughs> the other one is just to figure out like, how much are you spending and saving? Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that. Some people are really diligent and they say, I put everything on one credit card. And so you could just go look and say, well, this is how much I spend. And some people aren't, uh, and they might need to use a, you know, software to track it or, you know, a spreadsheet. 
there's a great app um, called YNAB. You know, no affiliation to them, but YNAB.com you, stands for You Need a Budget. Uh, it's a great <laughs> like tool that you can use to kind of forecast out, you know, your spending. And, you know, they take this idea that I think is really meaningful of, you know, allocating your spending in advance, which forces you to prioritize what you care about. Uh, um, yes. An interesting thing I learned was, you know, I really value experiences and like, you know, trying new things and whether that's going to some kind of show or taking a class. But when I looked at my spending last year, I realized that it made up like less than 1% of all my spending. And so my wife and I were like, well, this doesn't make sense. Like if this is a thing we care about a lot, why are we spending more money on all these other categories? Mm -hmm. Um, so I tell people like step one is really just figure out where you're at. What, what is your total, you know, sum of all of your assets minus your debt. And then what are you, what are you able to save or spend each month? So you can take what you earn, you can take what you spend and kind of look at the difference. And that kind of ultimately ends up being how much you can save each month. Yeah. There's, I've seen a number of adverts for, uh, online banking facilities that will break down your spending across multiple different areas. So it's like this much on leisure and this much on food and drink and this much on coffee or whatever it is that coffee probably actually makes up a fair proportion of a lot of people's yearly spending. I'm going to guess in Silicon Valley, it'll be like 20%. Yeah. I mean, it depends if you if work at a startup, you probably get free coffee. But, uh, if you're a freelancer, you probably coffee is your price of office space. Well, it's your lifeblood, uh, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's those, that's the first step is just where are you at? Because to kind of think about anything down the road, you need to really figure out where you're at. Um, you know, I always think like a good second step from figure out where you're at, but then it's like, let's build a kind of an initial foundation. So the, the first thing that I think everyone should probably do is put aside some type of emergency fund. Um, you know, if you have a really, really stable job working for the government, maybe it doesn't have to be that big. Maybe it's, you know, two, three months of income. If you are freelancing and you never know where your next job's coming from, maybe it should be six or even 12 months. Yeah. Um, but, you know, set aside some money that, you know, you can be ready to weather whatever unexpected expense or situation comes across because the last thing you want to have to do is have a situation arise and, you know, sell a retirement portfolio or, you know, borrow money. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I always tell people that, you know, I'd recommend putting it in a high yield savings account or something that earns some interest, um, you know, because if you leave it at a checking account at the bank, it probably won't earn enough interest. I agree. Um, you, um, you started up a website, right? Just after 2008, that was, that I guess would have been similar to, uh, the nightmare scenario that we're talking about here, if you get laid off. Yeah. So I started this thing called laid off camp and we did events around the country trying to help people figure out what to do after the 2008 financial crisis. And, you know, I was fortunate that I had saved up a little money. So when I needed to, you know, supplant my income with something, I had it. But, you know, one of the reasons a lot of people came to the event was they were like, I, I don't have any money. Like, <laughs> and so we had, can I learn how to freelance, how to start a company, how to get a job? Because, you know, they didn't set aside an emergency fund. Yeah. Have any of the, uh, uh, any or many of the guys and girls who you met at those events, have they gone on to do any cool stuff or do you keep in contact with any of the people who you met then? Yeah, it was really funny. We're, we're talking about at my current startup, you know, a bunch of different tactics for growth. And my co-founder handed me a book and he was like, you should read this book. It's amazing. And I looked at the author and I was like, man, that name's so familiar. And I was like, oh my God, this is this guy that got laid off and he helped organize the laid off camp in LA uh, and like he went on to become a well-known person in the growth community and write a book and all this stuff. And I sh shot him a note and I was like, this is so wild. Congratulations. All that kind of stuff. So yeah, definitely. I keep randomly seeing people from, from that stage of my life go on to do amazing things. That's so cool. It's brilliant to turn around, uh, stick a big middle finger up at people that laid you off <laughs> by becoming ridiculously successful. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think about that all the time. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah we um me and the co-hosts on the show are uh, all self-employed or to one degree or another and um there's i think making it on your own or going for it on your own is a really cool idea for a lot of people but the reality can be it can be quite cutthroat i'm gonna guess in silicon valley that's like the the tip of the spear for for people in cutthroat industries going off on their own. Yeah, I mean, 
it's this thing that almost maybe has become too sexy, right? Like <laughs> everyone wants to go start a yeah. company and sometimes I meet people that, you know, they just feel like it's the thing they have to do and they haven't even thought about it. They're just like, I got to start a company. That's what everyone does. And I'm like, well, you don't have to start a company. Like there are a lot of other options, but everyone's like, oh, I just want to start a company. I want to start a company. So, yeah. um, it is kind of funny that, you know, I see that happening, you know, wildly all over the place. Do you think that that's a byproduct of people being kind of disenchanted or disenfranchised with their current work? Like if you have a normal job where you don't feel like you have a lot of meaning, I was listening to Johan Hari's book, uh, uh, Lost Connections, which is uh, about the causes of depression. And in that he cites a, a statistic that says 20% of Americans are actively unhappy at their job, actively unengaged, a further 60% are indifferent and only 20% are actively engaged. And when you think that you're spending, you know, between 35 and maybe 50, 60 hours a week doing this particular thing and it forms the basis for who you are, right? Like when you meet someone, the, the questions you ask is like, what's your name? Where are you? Where are you from? And what do you do? It's like your name and what you do are, like they might as well be the same thing, right? It's hi, my name's Chris. I'm a club promoter. Blah blah blah, whatever it might be. And I think that people being so unhappy with that leads them to kind of maybe knee jerk in the opposite direction and go, right, well, what's the exact opposite of what I'm doing now? Because if I'm unhappy doing this, then the right thing must be complete opposite. I start a company. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. It's kind of been this weird shift where I'm not convinced that 30 years ago people thought about it like that, right? Like. You know, it seemed like everyone I've talked to, you know, that's been in the workforce for 20, 30 years, the, the idea is like you work to live. And, you know, now there's this mind shift of like, no, 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 I have a lot of freedom and, and responsibility over what I do. I'm going to live to work and, you know, I want to be fulfilled every day of my life. And, you know, that sometimes has a problem with personal finance because, you know, if you're like, oh, I don't love this job, so I shouldn't do it. It's like, okay, that might be true, but like you also need to be able to provide for your family. You need to save for the future. Uh, I meet people in their 30s and sometimes I'm like, hey, you know, how, how long do you want to live? You know, how long do you think you're going to live? And they're like, I don't know, 100. And I'm like, okay, well, you know that if you're, you know, 30 right now and you're going to work till you're 65 and then live to 100, like in the next 35 years, you have to save enough money to live for 35 <laughs> more years. That's like, such a good so, point. you know, like, it's crazy that, you know, you end up needing to save like, you know, almost as many years as you work, you need to save for. Um, and a lot of people are like, well, when I retire, that's when I'm going to travel. I'm like, okay, well, your expenses are going to go up. So you need to save even more. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, uh, you know, I think people need to find a balance of like, you know, working to everyone should try to be fulfilled in their work and do something they're excited about, but not lose sight of the fact that they also probably have some responsibilities to themselves, to their family that, you know, sometimes I think might come in the way of, of, you know, trying to find the dream job, which, you know, I, I worry that there isn't really ever the dream job. Yeah. The, the analogy of the, uh, the, it being too sexy of an idea, like it is the hot new girl at school that like everybody everybody wants to wants to be going out with you are you are totally right um so we've talked about uh, understanding our uh, current sort of capital worth um we've spoken about um trying to forecast as well look at where we're at now and then also forecast that forwards how much money have we got coming in how much money have we got going out what would you advise for people who were thinking right okay i've i've got myself to that stage what goes what yep. comes next yeah. So the two big things I think that come next are like, make sure you don't have any high interest debt. Uh, it's amazing how often I find people that have the means to pay off high interest debt, but just haven't for reasons that, you know, they never pro did the math, right? People don't think about math, you know, finances like spreadsheets or like I would. Um, and you know, so I went in and, you know, looked at the situation. I was like, you have credit card debt. It's at 22% interest. Like you have the money to pay it off. Why aren't you paying it off? And the answer sometimes is like, well, I didn't want to dip into my savings. And I'd say, well, is your savings earning 22%? And they're like, no, 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 it's earning 1%. I'm like, well, then you should definitely, definitely like pay off your 22% debt to with your interest savings, it's only earning 1%. But, you know, it's not something that people always think about. So yeah. like a big thing. So set aside some money in case something happens. 
pay off high interest debt, whether that's credit cards, personal loans, that kind of stuff. And then the other is like, make sure you kind of dial up retirement contributions. Um, you know, you can't wait till you're retired to, you know, get the tax benefits of a lot of different retirement contributions. And so, you know, whether that's pensions in the UK, 401ks in the US, you know, you know, I think in Australia you get superannuation and your company does it all for you, which is great. But, uh, well, nice. you know, here, here, if you don't put money in, in one year, you can't get that credit for the next year. Like you're capped each year at how much money you can set aside for retirement tax free. So, right. you know, I can encourage you- people to make sure that they do that early because you can't, you can't play catch up like uh, like you might wish you could later. Like overpayments or whatever. Can you briefly, because I the only time that I've heard 401k mentioned is in uh, Die Hard 4.0. Like that's, that's like the only time that I've ever heard it mentioned. Can you, for the Brits that are listening, can you briefly explain what it is or how it works? Yeah. Um, 401ks, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot, yeah. I just lost audio for one second. I was like, when you said that one word. Um, yeah, so in the U.S., we have this system where you can put aside a certain amount of money each year. Um, you can choose whether you want to pay the taxes now and never again or not now and when you retire. Um, so, you know, uh, in the U.S., you're allowed to contribute personally tax-free up to, it keeps changing every year, but about $19,000 a year. Um and so you have their employer sponsored plans um, so that, you know, if you're self-employed, there's a whole different system. And if you work in a government entity, there's a, yet another different system. If you work for an educational company, like a teacher, there's a different system. But the most common one for working at private companies is a 401k. And it's just an account that you can put money in, invest uh, those funds in mutual funds, uh, you know, whatever, whether it's stocks or bonds or real estate and um you know, at the end, the most common one is you put your money in tax free while you're working and then you earn all the, you know, capital gains and interest over time. And then when you retire, you only pay taxes when you take the money out. Mm-hmm. Um, and presumably the the idea would be that, you know, when you're working, you're in a higher tax bracket than when you're not working. So you get both the benefits of being able to invest your money, you know, before you pay the taxes and not, ha- you know, paying hopefully lower taxes when you take it out. Oh, yeah. Awesome. That's a really, really good setup. I don't, I don't fully understand how the UK pension scheme works. It's not a million miles away from that, but I, uh, I don't know about the caps. I don't know about the nineteen thousand. What's mad though, like you think, like if you, even if you take nineteen thousand, if that's the maximum that you can save, if you, if you don't have surplus income on top of what you're earning per year, except for that, for a retirement fund, and we roll forward the thirty-five years to earn seventy years of living uh, analogy that you used earlier on, like $19,000 a year is like, you're going to have to really get up towards that, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's some interesting things about compound interest. Uh, You know, the best example I have is, you know, if you had two friends and one of them was saving $3,000 a year um, from 25 to 35 and then stopped, they just saved 3000 a year for 10 years. Yeah. And you've got another friend that saved $3,000 a year starting when they were 35 all the way till 70. And so they're saving for 35 years and the other person's saving for 10 years. Um, you know, the first person's ended up contributing $30,000 to their savings. The next person contributed 105. But if those accounts grew at 7% a year, the friend that put in the 30000 in for only 10 years would have more money than the person who put in $3,000 a year for 35 years. Um, so the, I mean, the math, you know, it it ends up that that 10, that money can grow so much more because the interest is growing for longer and you started it earlier. Uh Uh, so I would say, you know, if you put in $19,000 a year for 30 years, you're going to end up with a lot more than, you know, 30 times 19,000. Um, but if you wait till you're, you know, five years from retirement to start savings, you don't have the, you, to start saving. You don't have the time to benefit from all that compound interest. Yeah, I get that completely. So would you recommend um, or how much do you tend to recommend to people to try and have m- multiple revenues of uh, multiple income streams? Yeah. So, you know, I think I might deviate from like the zeitgeist of like internet money hackers that are like, find your side hustle, find your multiple streams of income, buy rental properties. Like, you know, I have two income streams, right? I have a job 
and I have an investment portfolio. And in that investment portfolio, I might invest in stocks. I might invest in uh, REIT funds, which are, you know, kind of effectively investing in a fund that holds a bunch of pieces of a bunch of companies that own property and they all rent them out. So, you know, I've chosen to say, instead of me managing a rental property, instead of me managing owning a small piece of 10 different startups, I'm going to invest in a diverse portfolio with a bunch of index funds that invest in all of those things. So sure, you could say I have, you know, a thousands of income streams because I'm invested in a thousands of companies, but yeah. you know, effectively I have an investment portfolio and a job. Um, I'm not personally, you know, trying to do anything else. Uh, running a company is enough, uh, work for me that I'm not trying to, you know, have seven side hustles. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a balance, I suppose, between the time that you have available and, yeah. and, and, so, and also how much money you want. Like if money's not yeah, bi- if money's money not want. a big deal to you, then like just do your minimum effective dose to live, and then spend the rest yeah. of your time like chilling out. Yeah. So I always say like step one is figure out where you're at. Step two is kind of build your foundation. But then step three is like actually make a plan, right? So what are your goals? If your goal is to own a Ferrari, well, you might need to save more money. But if your goal is just to like live a comfortable life with your family and, you know, the extra money that you could save might prevent you from spending time with them. Like you might not actually want to go get that side hustle. Yes. Yeah. So I always say like, what do you want? How do you want to retire really early? Do you want to buy a home? Like, you know, do you want to start a company? Do you want to pay for your kids to go to a private university? Um, Like what's the most important thing to you? And when you prioritize those things and kind of figure out what they involve, like that's when you can make real decisions. But if you've never really thought about it, you know, sometimes I see people spending money when they haven't realized that they care about things more than spending, right? You mentioned coffee. Uh, Let's say you go buy your $5 latte every morning, sum that up over the year and you're like, wow, you know, that's actually, you know, could have been, you know, a couple thousand dollars maybe. Yeah. Um, But if you ask the someone say, hey, you know, do you, is that coffee, does that get you through the day enough that it's worth, you know, you know, over a decade or so being able to save up your part of your kid's education. And someone might say, oh my gosh, when I think about it like that, no. But before I hadn't made any plans. And so I wasn't thinking about it in any way. And I think that's where it gets really tough is if people aren't thinking through all of these things in advance. I couldn't agree more. So my business partner, Darren, and the guys in the office that are listening right now will know what I'm going to say. But Darren's ethos is always that if you times any number by 52, it becomes fucking massive. And it's like, when we're looking at our set of company accounts and we're like, oh, well, we could we could chip this off here or we could knock a couple of hours off there. And at the time, it doesn't really feel like that big of a deal. But like, if we can save five quid across four shifts on one particular club night, it's a thousand pounds a year. Like to, at the end of the year, there is 1,000 pounds more because we, yeah. we, we knocked four by five pounds off a couple of shifts once a week. And you're like, holy fucking shit. Like, that's so much money. I know that that's literally the most basic of maths. It's 20 times 50, but it's just so much money. Yep. Like, yeah, it's uh, it's really easy to think. You know, we, we think about that. You know, how much money do we want to spend? We, we provide lunches at the office and we were like, well, you know, <laughs> when we were small, it didn't really matter whether we went to a place and it was, you know, 10 bucks or 12 bucks like or eight bucks. It didn't matter. But we're like, wow. When you multiply five lunches a day by 20 employees by, you know, 50, you know, five days a week times, you know, 52 weeks, like all of a sudden you're like, wow, if we can cut a dollar per lunch off, we save a lot of money. Yeah. You're giving my business partner an aneurysm now at the moment with him hearing those, (laughs) hearing those figures. Um, So in terms of, we've spoken about the fact that uh, generating extra streams of revenue might not be something that's for everyone, but I'm going to guess that dialing down your spending or at least not having uh, frivolous spending is a, a, a principle that most people probably should and could stick to. Have you got any uh, sort of hacks or principles that you like to use when it comes to uh, tightening the, the sort of uh, belt buckle, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's not necessarily all of the spending, right? It's not... I wouldn't say frivolous spending. Well, frivolous by nature, probably, you know, that word might imply that it's not necessary. But um, there are some people that if you look at, 
you know, if you've already figured out what you need to save and you're already on track for it, um, you know, what you might be able to do by saving another thousand dollars a year might not be worth it, right? Like you might say it for me, you know, for me to cut another three thousand dollars out might mean I can't take another vacation. And what would I get from saving three thousand more dollars a year? Maybe what that gets me is like, you know, slightly better lifestyle in retirement. But if I've already saved enough to live the lifestyle I want in retirement, maybe the best thing is to keep spending the money on travel. Yeah. Um, but it if comes I back to making a plan, right? Exactly. If you haven't figured that out, you know, for most people, they haven't figured that out. For most people, they're probably not saving as much as they should. And so, you know, broadly speaking, yes, it's like very common that I talk to people and a good thing for them to do is to spend less money. Uh, I just don't want to make the blanket statement because for some people, you know, keeping their current level of spending or potentially even increasing it. Um, you know, I'm so frugal with money that I have friends that are like, you realize like if you just, you know, die and have all this money, but you've never spent it, you wouldn't have lived a good life. Like, why don't you live a little like, you know, why don't you, you know, get the nice uh, entree instead of like, eat, you know, split it with your wife because you don't want to spend the extra 20 bucks, um, you know, <laughs> I, so I, I couldn't agree. I'm more. just this crazy optimizer that, you know, probably could afford to not optimize as much and, you know, optimize for convenience. And so even though we can bring dogs to work, I finally buckled down and hired someone to come walk our dog during the day yeah. because, you know, I could just get so much more done when I'm not thinking about having to leave and take the dog out and schedule meetings around it. Uh, so it's just hard when, you know, my wa brain is just wired so much differently to save every dollar. Yeah, I get that. And also having your dog in the office is going to be like, yeah, it might be distracting, but it's fun. Like it's nice. Yeah. It's nice to have dogs around, right? Their morale, good little, little I, furry I think so. balls of morale. Um, though at some point you're like, oh wow, we have so many people that work here. Uh, maybe the problem is like we can't have a dog in the office every day because you know people are allergic. Like all these things when you're a small company that you don't think about. Now you become a big company and you're like, well, we have thirty people. Like maybe someone's actually allergic to dogs, so we yeah. can't have a dog in the office. Oh man, uh, don't hire them. If someone, if just they're not, they're not allowed. Like they have to sit in their own cubicle over the far side and everyone else can play with the dog. That's how, that's how I think it would work. But yeah, I, I totally get what you mean. I think I'm wired a similar way to yourself. I remember a couple of years ago in Asda at like two in the morning after I'd finished work at one of our club nights, it's 2 a.m. And I'm looking at the difference between like the value yogurt and like the finest yogurt. And I'm like having an existential crisis about which of these yogurt do I do, do I get the value? Oh, well, I mean, it's 20, 25 pence more to get the other one. I'm stopped and kind of checked myself. And I was like, what on earth are you doing? Like, just, just pay 25 pence. Like you work so much. Just put the 25 pence yogurt into your basket and get out. It's 2, 2 a.m. But yeah, I, I, people tend to be wired in one of two ways, I, I, I think. And you've got the ones who are maybe on our side fighting about the yogurt. And then you've got some people who... Maybe uh, maybe we could do with tightening up a little bit. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the same way. And it's my people are think I'm crazy. But, um, you know, I've got like 15 different credit cards and I decide which one and, uh, you know, to use based on whether it earns more points on certain things. Wow. That is OK. Yeah, that's that's another level. So I wanted to uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to move on to the company that you're at now. I wanted you to give us a little bit of background about that and and, and tell us what's going on. Yeah, so oh, I just dropped the microphone. <laughs> uh, yeah, so right now I left Google about two years ago to start a company called Grove. And, you know, what we realized was no matter how much I wanted people to build cash flow models for themselves and forecast out all of their spending, you know, the reality is many people, you know, are get enough overwhelmed with personal finance that they're not going to do their own financial planning without some help. Mm -hmm. Um, and the industry has evolved to a place where the only support is for people who already have a million dollars. You know, like that's the industry is like, we'll manage your money, but only if you have a lot. And if you don't have a lot, maybe we'll work with you, but we're going to charge you, you know, a few thousand dollars a year. And everyone doing this is, you know, old school and, you know, prints out hundred page documents. And so the vision was, how do you build a company, um, that uses enough technology to make financial planners efficient enough 
that when someone says, you know, I want help, I want to figure out what I should be doing with my money, I want to organize things, I want to, you know, talk to someone about my goals so that we can put together a plan and make sure I'm on track. Like we can offer that to you for less, you know, less than half the cost of the the rest of the industry because, you know, they're still doing in-person meetings and having you write things on pieces of paper and, you know, scanning them in. And, you know, so we built our own technology stack that lets our team of financial planners uh, work with people uh, at much less, much less the cost than a traditional financial planner. I, yeah, I, it blows my mind that that isn't more common. Like it it's yeah. absolutely blows my mind. Like everyone, you've already said, most people don't have a natural ability unless you are my business partner, but he's a freak of nature. And he was, he was born like with a laptop, uh, building spreadsheets. Um, if you're not, if you're not wired like him or, or yourself, like, where do you learn this stuff from? Like you have to be deep down in the medium archives or living on Reddit or like God knows where to be able to get this. So the fact that you can't, and you are right as well. Like you think financial planner, you're like, Oh my God, uh, velour uh, curtains and a Mont Blanc pen and a Chesterfield red sofa and a smoking jacket and oak everywhere in this huge big building. You do, you think like, oh, it's it's built for millionaires. Yep. And so I always say like, if you don't have a million dollars or you don't want to spend thousands of dollars a year and you don't want to learn it yourself, you're kind of out of luck. Like there isn't really a good alternative. Um, so that was why we started the company. We thought that there should be an alternative. There should be a company out there built from the ground up with, you know, the responsibilities of putting a customer's interest in for first. Uh, I don't know how this is in the UK, but in the U S um, there's this rule called the fiduciary rule. And, um, you know, it'll, it doesn't, it's not a mandate, which, so the fiduciary responsibility means you're required to act in your customer's best interest. Uh -huh. um, I've heard, I've heard of that on movies before. Yeah, it is not required that financial advisors in the U.S. be fiduciaries. So nine out of 10 financial advisors in the U.S. are not required or do not hold themselves to a standard of acting in their customers' best interest at all times. But whose best interest are they acting in? Uh, often the companies. Oh my so God. it's totally legal in the U.S. to be a financial advisor and recommend products that cost twice as much as other products uh, and you make the money that's the difference. Totally fine. And that's how the industry's evolved. Um, so when we started the company, we we're like, well, we're not going to do that. So we decided we're going to be fiduciaries. We're going to always act in our customer's best interest. We're not going to make money selling other products like most of the people in the industry do. Uh, and that's rare, unfortunately. Um, but it's kind of what we believe in. That is so, I'd love to find out anyone who knows whether or not this is the same in the UK, please do drop me a message and let me know. Because if it's, if that is the same in the UK, that is such a stupid loophole. Like... Yeah, they, they tried to pass a law in the U.S. last year uh, or the year before, and it didn't get anywhere. And it was going to require that anyone that helps people with their retirement plans uh, is required to act in their client's best interests. Um, the problem is there's like 20 giant institutions in the U.S. that would just go out of business instantly because their entire business is selling people things that don't meet that level of responsibility. This is like and the, big, big companies, big, big financial institutions, like ones, you know, like the entire business is built on selling life insurance oh policies God. that aren't good for you. This is blowing my mind. Like, I, it, it sounds to me like the financial services equivalent of uh, medical and pharma companies advertising on TV. Like that, that it, it, like you do not necessarily need this particular thing but we're going to force it down your neck in any case. Like, I, 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 it, that's how it seems to me. We don't have that in the UK. We don't have the, the, the big pharma advertising stuff in there. And I'm really, really hoping that we don't have financial advisors <laughs> that are able to give advice that's like just stiffing people. And get paid for it. It's I, I'm, it would be totally it. legal for me to say, pay me and I will give you advice, but I'll turn around and sell you something that you might not need. Uh, it has to be, what, I forgot what the the exact term is, it has to be like directionally right. So if you tell me that you want to invest in the stock market, I can't sell you a bond, right? Yeah. Right. But if you say you want to take a long-term risk and that's aligned with stock market, I can say my company offers a fund that is not very different from the fund that has no fees and our, one, our fund takes 2% of your money every year. That's totally fine. As long as it's directionally, you know, it can't be the wrong type of investment. So it's crazy. Um, one, you know, they, I keep hearing that states might start trying to pass these laws themselves. 
because they can't get it passed at the federal level. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's unfortunate. It's just a byproduct of being a huge, big new country, I suppose, isn't it? And uh, there's there's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of problems for for trying to get that sort of stuff passed. But Matt, I, I, you know that that is um, that's scary. Like when you think that that could be, well, it's not going to be mine because my mom and dad are both British. But that could be someone's mom and dad. Like that could be their retirement fund. That could have been them working their no, whole life. It lives. usually is. <laughs> And they think I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go in with my paycheck and I'm going to speak to this guy and he's going to be charming. And then he's going to give me this information that's going to completely screw me over. So, I mean, was there not, was there, did no one tighten up after 2008 with stuff like that? Uh, they tight, the, the companies tightened up to make sure the banks didn't lose more money. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I just, uh, I pulled up an article it says currently advisors in the UK are bound by the FCA's conduct of business rules but have no formal legal duty to act in the best interest of the clients at all times. God. <laughs> so oh. that doesn't, uh, you know, that was my, you know, quick 10 second research. So well, I could man, be it's hey, I, I, if, if it's happening in the U S it makes me, it makes me think it very well might be happening here. So if you're using a financial advisor for the love of God, please double check what they're suggesting that you do. Um, is, is there any, yeah. I, I'm going to guess that you will be, uh, an anomaly in the industry with having this fiduciary kind of commitment? Yeah. So still the the good news is like one in 10 advisors in the U S do take on a fiduciary responsibility to their clients at all times. Um, you know, in the U S it's often called a fee only advisor, meaning we only, we only make money from the fees our clients pay us. Um, it's actually pretty easy in the U S if you just ask any of your financial advisors, say, are you a fiduciary? You get one of two answers. Yes. Or you get this weird answer. That's like, (laughs) We really care about our customers, <laughs> but uh, there's a there's a John Oliver who who does a show on HBO skit uh, all about you know finance and retirement plans and the fiduciary responsibility that's quite funny, um, digging into how crazy it is and how possible it is for people to say they're acting in your best interest but not. Um, so I, I would say if you're ever going to hire someone to help you with money, just dig into this and like really understand the the legal you know obligations they're taking on. And you know I would encourage people that if your financial advisor is not taking on a responsibility to legally act in your best interest, and I don't mean like I care about you. I mean legally, if you ever <laughs> determine that I sold you something that wasn't in your best interest, like there is a legal responsibility I have, and and you can you know fight that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, that's the first thing you got to ask, surely. Like, are you are you going to be the guy who takes my money, or are you going to be the guy that makes me money? Like, that's... yeah, but you would be surprised at how good a salesman can answer the question of "Are you acting in my best interest?" Slippery and, and snaky good. answer. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I wish there was just like a like a health score. You know, you walk into a restaurant and you're like, "Oh, you have a D. I don't want to eat here." <laughs> but like, you know, there's yeah. no. Imagine if every financial advisor just had to like put a red X on their forehead if they didn't act in your best interest to be great. That would be much easier. There's a speaking of the uh, hygiene ratings. There is a subway right in the middle of Newcastle which scored a zero stars out of five food hygiene rating. For anyone wow. for anyone who's eaten at this subway on the bottom of Collingwood Street, it is my belief. I don't want to get sued here, but it is my belief that upon one of their most recent food hygiene checks, they got zero stars out of five. I mean. I don't even know how that's possible. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but uh, that's the that's the food equivalent of the financial service manager who's just taking your money. So um, one thing that I did notice very briefly before we go uh, on your medium, you were talking about hacking a Peloton uh, bike thing. And yep. uh, for the listeners who don't know, Peloton's kind of like a live guided cycle workout that you do at home and there's a screen and there's like a train. It's kind of like spinning class, but you don't actually have the person there in front of you, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like doing soul cycle or something like that in your living room. Um, yeah. And, you know, I don't, being an entrepreneur, you don't have a lot of time. Uh, I'm working all the time. So I didn't have, you know, I wasn't taking taking the time to go to a fitness class and Everyone, you know, was talking about Peloton. These bikes are beautiful, but you can actually get all their classes uh, on the app for, you know, way less expensively than buying this $2,000 bike. 
Yeah. Uh, and so I went on the adventure of buying a spin bike and, you know, attaching a couple different Bluetooth trackers to it and <laughs> mounting an iPhone to it and, you know, connecting it with AirPlay so I could watch the course of the class on my TV. And the irony behind this whole thing, which I feel guilty uh, mm. about, is that a friend of mine who had a Peloton moved and sold me it used. And I got to say, as much as I want to be like the man of the people and say, you know, build it yourself, the real thing is so good. <laughs> uh, and so I'm not sure I can tell you to pay full price because it's so expensive. But, uh, you know, it's like there is you could find 10 smartphones that tell you they do every single feature the same as another one. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, I still have an iPhone. Yeah. Uh, so, you know. <sighs> Man, it's one of those things. I, it's it's when you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And the thing is as well, the degree of satisfaction that you will get from being so frugal, like the the inherent joy of like blasting the system and being like, no, no, fuck you. Like mine cost $175 and yours was two thousand is gonna be worth is gonna be worth a lot, but you think like oh, the real thing's just nice and it's there and it's ready. Yeah, I don't think I realized. So what I would say is if I hadn't realized how driven I am by competition, uh, the one thing building your own Peloton won't let you do is it won't log your, you know, your workouts in the app because the bike is not actually connected to Peloton. Yes. So one time I was staying at a hotel that had a Peloton and I got on a ride and I saw real time like my friend's stats versus mine. And I was like, man, in that one bike ride, he was like a little bit better. And I was like, I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow morning. I'm going to destroy him. Like I am just <laughs> going to like out cycle him. And that moment I was like, oh my gosh, I think I burned 20% more calories in a workout, uh, knowing that I was trying to beat my friend than I did before. And I was like, I will pay for something that allows me to get 20% more workout in the same time. Yeah. Um, uh, but I have friends that like they have a real Peloton and they're like, oh, I don't like riding with friends. I don't like the competition. I'm like, oh, you should definitely make a fake one. Yeah, exactly. I've got this fake difference. one at home. I've got this one that I've already yeah. built. It's like got old Bluetooth and there's AirPlay and all this sort of yeah. stuff. So I think what to a nice concluding note there is that we can say save money, but save money in the right place and not in the yeah. Make plan. Make sure that the places you're saving money are driven by what you care about. Um, and so, I, you know, there are people that might have a, spent a lot of money on fitness, but it's really important to them. And like, that's fine. You know, like the reality is if fitness is more important to you than where that money could go, that might not be a bad use of it. But if you haven't figured out whether, you know, if, you know, you need that money to do something more important three years, five years, 10 years, whether it's buy a home or start a family, like it's really hard to make those decisions. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is the best way to do it is to build a cash flow model for the future of your life. Uh, and, you know, run a bunch of simulations, which effectively is the software we've built for our advisors. But, um, you know, so there's a, a basic way to like at least evaluate your goals and think about them. And if you want to take it to the next step, think about working with someone who can help do it for you if, if you're not going to go build the models yourself. Yeah, I mean, building financial forecasting models does sound like, for me, the least fun afternoon in the world. But obviously for me it sounds like an adventure that's you that's heaven for you you're just bathing in financial forecast models and expert excel sheets fall from the sky um so yeah. finally one thing i wanted to finish on chris are there any resources or blogs or websites that are accessible to the avatar of the lay person that you think would be uh, good for people to check on or have you got any resources that you guys offer yeah i mean you know we, we have a service that you're welcome to check out if you're based in the U.S. Uh, at hellogrove.com. Um, you know, there's a bunch of good books, you know, that just talk about the basics. And honestly, you know, your personality, uh, you know, the style you're interested in, it, it almost doesn't matter. Find the book that speaks to you the most. Find the blog that speaks to you the most. You know, if you're really into retiring early, it might be Mr. Money Mustache. Um you know, there's a movie coming out later this year called Playing with Fire that kind of really dives into the movement of people trying to retire early um, and, and seek financial independence. Um, 
you know, ultimately what matters is that you're, you're excited and motivated by it. So instead of picking a, a resource that I think is really good, I'll say, pick whatever resource speaks to you. Yep. Um, but I will say, take a look at the book, happy money, which is kind of like a psychological evaluation of ways to spend money that actually increase your happiness. And it's shocking how much just reading this quick, like, you know, it seems like a hundred page book might change your perspective on spending. Uh, and, and focus you on like, how can you make sure that you're using money to fulfill your life and not just to perpetuate things that you're doing for no reason? That's an awesome idea. I love that. I'm going to guess that that will have been one of the uh, spurring on moments for yourself when it came to looking at the experiences in life and then realizing that it was like 1% of your annual spending. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, you identify these things that can actually bring fulfillment to life, which, as you mentioned earlier, is what we're all seeking. And so if someone's going to go do, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of research on how you can apply your money towards, you know, fulfilling your life, like, yeah, I'd rather read the book than go do the research myself. Couldn't agree more. So, Chris, before you go, can you tell the listeners where they can find you online, where they can learn out more about yourself? Yeah, I'm I'm Chris Hutchins uh, dot com is my my personal site Hutchins on Twitter and and then Grove is just hellogrove.com. dot com. Amazing man, it, it's been an absolute blast. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.